<laughs> if you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this, what are some true, scary experiences that you have been through? Creepy strangers, unexplainable incidents, etc. This one happened a few months ago. I live in the backwoods of the North Georgia mountains, and it makes for some great hiking, camping, and wood smoking. Anyway, my brother and I went out for a 10-mile hike last weekend before all the snow came down. When we get on the trail, we're probably about 15 to 20 miles from the nearest town. This area was freaking isolated. We were walking for a few hours, trying to find somewhere to camp, when we heard this god-awful shrieking. It wasn't just screaming, it had this blood-freezing shrill frequency that I didn't think anyone could possibly reach. After the screaming subsided, we heard this barking in the distance, followed by whoops and hollers that, to me, sounded like drunken hillbillies had just killed someone. I was playing that horrible scene from Deliverance over and over in my head, and we did not feel safe at all. After about 10 minutes of listening to this, we hauled ourselves to where the sounds were coming from, fearing what we would find. The sun set, and we stupidly were still floundering about in the woods, carrying nothing between us but a few meals worth of food, a few grams of pot, sleeping bags, and a tent. It was dark, we were scared out of our minds, and I just wanted to get the hell out of the woods and back to my car. At around 8, the sun had long set, and we were wandering around shivering with flashlights. We didn't have any weapons on us, just multi-tools. Brennan just said, screw it. Let's set up camp here. We knew we were lost, and we were as cold as Satan's rectum. We set up our tent haphazardly, piled in, and slept uneasily. The next morning, Bren prodded me awake. He was shaking, either from cold or fear. I figured our tent's rain fly had been torn off by the wind. We stepped outside and promptly both almost spit ourselves. The tent fly was torn to shreds on the ground, the stakes were upended, and there was a ducking noose hanging from the tree across the clearing. Naturally, we broke camp and ran almost four miles through the woods to come out by a road, followed the road to where I parked, and got the hell out. In my 19 years of living in the middle of nowhere, I've never felt that vulnerable in the woods. My girl had recently dumped me, so my insomnia had kicked in full speed ahead. I was bored and lonely, and I started taking late-night drives in my parents' minivan, a good old Dodge Caravan. A cute red-headed friend of mine often accompanied me on these trips. Bless her for keeping me company. It was about 2 or 3 a.m., and we were driving around a suburb near the all-female college in town. This particular suburb and the college are right next to a wildlife conservation area. Well, I stop for a stop sign at a T-junction. I'm heading straight through, and the road ahead goes for maybe 50 meters, then makes a right turn down a hill. Beyond the right turn are the buildings for the college. I glance to my right to see if anyone's coming. But then I see my friend's face when I do so, and damn, she's gone completely white, and her eyes are wide as saucers. Wondering what the hell she's looking at, I look forward, and holy friggin' hell. Crossing the street in front of me, maybe 20 meters ahead and illuminated from behind by a bright light from a building, is something tall, walking on two legs, with a goddamn mane of hair. And it was walking so smoothly. I'll never forget it, it almost glided across the road. There was no head bob. Being the adventurous soul that I was then, I actually went in pursuit, I drove forward and made a left into the parking lot, the parking lot is for the college, and behind it is the conservation area. But just as I was fumbling around for a flashlight to go after the thing, my friend, probably wisely, grabbed my arm and refused to let me go. I'll always wonder what I saw that night. Even creepier, it turned out to be a full moon. Go figure. I probably would have dismissed what I saw as my own imagination, but I can't really do that when I'm not the only one that saw something out there. I'd just gotten hold of my first car a few years ago and took it out to the country lanes to drive fast and just generally mess around. It was around 7 pm and just getting dark. After half an hour of wheel spin and speeding, I pulled over to reply to messages and browse in my new car. I looked up in my rear view mirror and saw a man around 6 feet tall, crouched just enough for me to make eye contact, with a black canvas mask and his hood up, just watching me with wide eyes. He noticed I'd seen him and made a grab for my driver's door, luckily, I'd locked it. I floored the car and drove home so quickly. Never been back. Duck that shit. One night many years ago, I was in the bottom bunk, my little brother was on the top bunk, he was about 9 at the time and I was 16-ish, playing with my cell. It was already pretty late, and I could hear my little brother playing with toys in the closet and giggling. I thought he wanted to scare me since the room or closet had no lights on and I would generally charge my phone at the outlet next to the closet. He would always try to get me back after I scared him. After a couple of minutes, 
I got up and turned on the closet light, and in the middle of saying, dude, go to sleep, I realized that there's no one in the closet. In shock, I'm staring blankly into the closet. Then I turned and looked at the top bunk, and I saw my brother lying down and sleeping. I could not understand what was going on and ran to my parents' room, where they told me I was an idiot and to just go back to bed. I couldn't sleep that night. I was just waiting for the giggling and shuffling in the closet. The creepiest thing happened to me in our previous house. I was walking down a path in the forest after getting tired of mountain biking when I looked up and saw someone farther up the path. This was a long, straight path, and I wonder how I didn't see them before, but I don't really care because my legs hurt like a bitch and I can hardly breathe. I keep walking, but the figure then stops and turns around. I'm feeling uneasy because the first thing that pops into my mind is that he may have other friends walking behind me or something, but instead he just lifts his arm and starts waving wildly while tilting his head from side to side for a full minute. My heart's pounding, and I consider throwing my bike and running in the opposite direction just to get away from this creep. Then he stops, turns 90 degrees to the right, and walks off the path and into the woods. This is where I stop worrying about kidnapping and start shitting my pants. This was a path in a rainforest, and walking off the path is a good way to get lost and never be found afterwards. I would have noped the duck out of there, but it was a straight path, and I had to keep going to get back to the road, so I got on my bike and pedaled like the devil was on my trail. Just as I pass by the point where the figure entered the forest, this rank stench sticks to the inside of my throat. It was so bad that I nearly crashed, but I righted myself at the last second and didn't stop until I reached the bottom of the path and kept going on the road to where I had parked my car. I never went back there, I sold my mountain bike and bought a racing bike a few months later. I don't know whether it was just some village idiot or whatever, but duck that noise. This was a few years ago, when I was sleeping on a fold-out bed at my grandparents' house. The layout was thus, living room, in which I was sleeping. There are two doorways, one leading to the kitchen and one leading to the rest of the house and the bathroom. You have to turn a corner to get through that second door. The time was 2 AM I was up for most of the night sitting on my phone, and I needed to take a dump. I got up to go, and I didn't turn on any lights because I didn't want to wake anyone up. My grandparents' dog, Tuna, was also sleeping on a chair near the bathroom. I took a dump and began to return to bed. I opened the door to the bathroom, walked out, turned the corner, and smashed my face against the empty air. I fell back and hit the ground hard. My nose was bleeding. I look up and see the empty hallway leading back towards the living room. There was nothing I could have run into, no door, no wall. I looked around, trying to see if it was my grandpa, who had a habit of sleeping and walking. No, I heard his snoring from the other end of the hallway. I turned back around and saw the glowing eyes of Tuna, the dog. He wasn't looking at me, though. He was looking at the empty space that I had just walked into. And softly whimpering. I panicked and ran back to bed, this time without being impeded by anything. Tuna continued to whimper for hours. Needless to say, I didn't really sleep that night. The next morning, I mentioned it to my grandpa, and he laughed it off, blaming it on my being tired. I laughed too, and I went to take Tuna out to use the facilities, i.e., the front lawn. As I approached the dog, I saw him still sitting in his chair, not running around like usual. I put my hand on him. He was cold. He was dead. When I turned 21 and my mom turned 50, we took a trip to San Diego together to celebrate. We stayed in an old bed and breakfast owned by a charming couple. The first night, I experienced sleep paralysis for the first time, and it was horrifying. I finally regained control of my body and woke my mother to tell her that I was too afraid to be alone. She fell back to sleep immediately, and I spent the entire night oscillating between freezing and sweating, feeling an intense sense of concern. The next morning we went downstairs for breakfast, and I told the owners about having a weird night. They look at each other and then hesitantly tell me how the man who built the house died in the room we were staying in, in 1888, and ghost hunters regularly request to investigate it. They also shared various stories of bizarre guest experiences. I've never forgotten those feelings. It's the Keating House, for anyone interested. True Story Around a year ago, I went on a Boy Scout campout. We were in the deep wilderness forests of Texas. We were in my friend's tent with five other people, besides me, around 11 p.m., and one of my friends pointed out on the open zipper a figure in the forest clearing. And I saw it, a pale thing ran away into the dark. And my friends, except me, ran to the parents. I was in the big tent. Then, to my horror, I heard footsteps. Booger Hollow, True Story When I was younger, my mom and my little brother went to visit our grandparents in Arkansas. They lived in the Arkansas River Valley. 
it's really hot there in the summer. Anyway, we were driving back to our grandparents' house. We went through a shortcut called Booger Hollow. I didn't believe in anything like that, but what I saw gave me the creeps. As we passed a house, I saw a huge black figure. He had a slender man type head, long arms, and long legs. After we got back to the house, I could not sleep at all. I kept looking at the front door to make sure nothing was there. It's a good thing my grandparents have an alarm system. About half month ago, I bought my very first house that was in the bush because I was living in a noisy town with non-stop sounds with only two neighbors who are really nice to me and to each other. Skip about two weeks ahead, when I had all my things with me, and I started to hear weird sounds from the basement around 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning, like quite banging and weird. When I woke up in the morning to check, I noticed the basement door had a heavy-duty lock on it. I was looking for the key, eventually finding it behind the kitchen door in a cabinet. I grabbed a flashlight and my small army pocket knife, just in case it was an animal trying to get out, unlocked it, slowly opened the door with my flashlight on, and turned on the lights. Everything looked like a normal basement, with your water pump and all that stuff, but I noticed a corner of the room had two concrete walls with an old-style white door, like from the 1990s, with no windows on the door or walls. I opened it, and it was a 5 by 6 meter room with nothing in it, just an empty room with no lights in it, just a lifeless room, but boy, I was completely wrong about that. I looked in the corner of the small room, and what I think I saw was a tall black figure with a V-shaped head and the body of a mangled human. It turned around, and that's when I could describe it even more. The eyes were solid white, and they had what looked like scribbles on them, making them look, I don't really like using this word, cursed, like from a horror movie. Then it screamed at me and started to chase me out of the basement. I dropped my knife at that point of time because I was afraid of this thing. I ran to the door, quickly closing it and locking it so it wouldn't get out. I could hear it quietly clawing and making the same sounds like the ones I hear almost every night. The next morning I decided to board up the door with five boards, grab chains, and lock it tight together so nothing would move or break out. Due to this, I still hear sounds here and there, but they're mostly active at night. I have so many questions, so I talked to my neighbor, who won't say his name, and their dad told them a story of a man who did dark magic and curse that land in the house with a demon that would torment them forever as long as they lived here until they moved away and off the land, basically protecting the land from new people that moved in. I used to deliver pizza on the weekends when I was in college. The town I worked in is very old and haunted. One night I took an order to a street that has a railroad that runs parallel with it, and between the street and the railroad is a drainage ditch. Just before I turn into the driveway, which is on the right, something catches my eye on the left. I turn my head and catch a glimpse of a dark figure crouched down in the drainage ditch, peering from behind some weeds. For a good three seconds, I looked at this figure before my subconscious forced me to look back at the road so that I didn't wreck. As I walked up to the door of the house, I kept an eye out in that direction because my first thought was that I was about to be robbed. As I knocked on the doorway, standing sideways to avoid being snuck up on, I kept thinking to myself whether that was a person or a spirit. The customer eventually opened the door, and I gave them their stuff. Walking back to my car, I again kept an eye open in that direction. Once I was safely inside my car with the doors locked, I could relax a little bit. I backed out of the driveway and made my way back to the store. When I passed by that spot, the figure was gone. I wondered how they could have moved without me hearing their feet crunch on the gravel. Maybe they were lying down and I couldn't see them. Why were they solid black even though there was a streetlight nearby? Given the history of this town, the fact that those tracks are probably 200 years old, and the fact that in this town there is very little crime, especially robbery, it wouldn't surprise me if it was a spirit. This happened three years ago. I was home alone, and I was watching a show in my dark room. I mean, I was scared since I have nyctophobia, the fear of the dark, but I didn't really pay attention to it since I was so into my show. That's when it happened. I heard a sound, and I noticed my closet was open, which was weird because I had closed it before. I thought it was just me, so I closed it without giving much thought to it. While I was up, I decided to turn on the lights, but when I did, I was freaked out. I noticed a shadow behind my window. It was behind me, so that was freaky, but I just went to my bathroom and locked myself in there until my parents came back. Boogie Man in the Forest, True Story So my sophomore year of college, me and my best friend decided to take Adderall so we could stay up all night and write the papers that were due that week. So we did it, and we stayed up really late and finally finished. It was about 3 a.m. when we decided to go get some food and smoke a joint. So we get in the car, get the food, and decide to smoke in the car at her apartment complex with the windows down. 
So as soon as we pulled into the parking spot, which was facing head on towards a big opening of woods, I felt like something was weird. But I just took a few bites of my food and rolled the joint anyway, thinking I was just spooking myself, but the whole time something felt off, and I felt like I could see something in the forest. The beginning of the forest was about 8 feet from my car. Finally, when we've been smoking the joint for about 2 minutes, I decide to actually look harder at the woods and the movement I am seeing. Immediately, as I look closer, I see two huge yellow eyes staring back at me. It was like they were just really big eyes on a white face peeking at me through the bush. Terrifying enough as it is, it doesn't end here. As soon as I made eye contact with it, the monster or man or monster man started coming straight for my car. Note that my lights were on, so whatever or whoever this was definitely knew we were in there, and I know it had been watching for a long time from the weird feelings I had before. I knew it had been staring right at my eyes for a while because when I finally looked, we made direct eye contact. It starts walking towards me, making direct eye contact with me. At first, me and my friend thought it was a police officer because we had weed, but it suddenly became clear that it was no police officer, and we aren't sure it was even human. This thing was either a man dressed like a monster or it was a monster. It looked like it had a mask of pale white, rotting skin on its face. I was so scared that I had a lot of trouble driving away. My first instinct was to hide and slide low in my seat, but I knew it was coming for me. I stared at the thing in paralyzed fear as it came closer and closer to me. I can't describe to you exactly what it was wearing or what it looked like because it doesn't make any sense, it's like my mind can't even go there. All I know is that it has the physique of a man, but the limbs are way too long. It looked like a slender man but was different, like it definitely had a face. Finally, I threw my car in reverse just in time. Thank goodness it was already on and I didn't have to search for the key or anything. When I finally was able to pull away, it was standing in the very parking spot I had just been parked in. Me and my friend called the police and told them there was a monster or a man in the woods. They said they checked but found nothing. We had been in my best friend's very own apartment complex when this happened, so we had to live with this memory every day. I have never walked to my apartment from my car without being on the phone with someone since that night, and it is four years later. It haunts me, and I hate that someone or something has scarred me so much just from one insane encounter. About six years ago, when my cousin, we'll call him James, was 15 and I was 7, our parents left us to go to a wedding. They trusted him enough to babysit me for a while so they could get to the wedding. It was more of the parents' friends, so we didn't really have to come, and it seemed cheaper to leave us at home. It was sometime in the fall, maybe the first week or so of November. He and I were playing games when there was scratching at the door. It was loud and animal-like. Something or someone wanted to get in. James had gotten up and walked over to the door to look at who it was, only to have the door kicked. It was like something wanted to break the door down. James had started to get nervous, and he looked at me. He was scared, and today I still don't know why. He was completely silent, and he quickly took me upstairs. It was only around 7, but it was dark, and he insisted that it was my bedtime. He tucked me into bed and went back downstairs. This was my aunt and uncle's house, and they hunted. They had a small number of guns, and I could tell that when James went downstairs again, he went to grab one of the guns. I started hearing loud shuffling outside in the leaves, and I called for him to come upstairs. He was up and next to my bed in less than a second with a gun in hand. I told him about what I was hearing outside and how I was scared. He looked outside and said there wasn't anything. By then, the scratching and kicking at the door had stopped, but I was still scared of someone trying to get in and hurt us. James stayed in my room and insisted we would be okay. I fell asleep, and from what I know, so did he. At around midnight, the shuffling started again, and it was in the house. I immediately started to cry, and that woke James up really fast. He got up, walked out of the room, and stood at the top of the stairs. Seconds later, I heard him shoot something and scream. He ran right back into the room and blocked the door with everything he could find. I will still be bawling my eyes out and barely registering what is going on. James sat on the bed next to me and tried to comfort me, but I was having none of it. I kept wailing at the top of my lungs. A minute or so later, there was scratching at the bedroom door. James grabbed his phone and called the police, with me now trying to push him so he's in front of me. I wanted to be far away from whatever that was. The scratching continued, and it seemed like hours until the police arrived. The sirens were the thing to scare whatever that thing was. So a couple of days ago, my boyfriend and I were driving up his road, which is in the middle of the woods, and as we turned a corner, we first saw the deer. The deer didn't even flinch at our car coming up the road, which was weird. Then we saw it. Now, I'm not normally a scared person, but seeing this thing almost made me piss myself. 
It looked as if this thing was talking to the deer. It had to be at least eight feet tall, very thin, and all black with wings. It flew up right in front of the car, and my boyfriend slammed on the brakes, turned to me, and said, tell me you saw that, and asked me to describe it to him to make sure he wasn't going crazy. I did, and we sped all the way home. This all happened in about a minute. Although it felt longer. I was telling my dad about it, and he saw the same exact creature years earlier at my sister's bus stop. He tried to convince my sister it was a garbage bag or something, but my sister's response was, Dad, that thing was too fast and too big to be a trash bag, and all my dad could say was, I don't know. I was on camp, and I hate camping, but as a leader, I had two. I brought my laptop to entertain me when I got there and set up the main tent when one of my friends named Anthony and the leader came up, and we were joking about when a gray blur ran across the field that made up our campsite. We both waited, and every scout was there. The rules said to begin cooking food. This was a survival camp, and the scout collected firewood. I lit the fire, and we started cooking rabbit when one of the campers screamed. Two bright eyes were staring out of a tree. Then I did a thing I regret, I yelled good joke, now get the hell out of there. My friend said to calm down and aimed his flashlight at the tree, and we saw the gray blur again. After one more hour, it was time to go to sleep, so we showed the scouts to their tents and moved to our own. I opened my laptop to get some work done when I heard a scream. I ran outside, looked around, and saw a group of scouts running towards me. I looked around and saw the bright eyes staring near their tent. I took the scouts into the main tent and asked them what they saw, and one of them said, we're not sure. I asked for any details, and they gave me one thing, it was gray. I woke up Anthony, and we both walked out. We had sharp kitchen knives. Then we walked up and saw a large gray shape. What the duck are you playing at? Anthony yelled, and it turned around. It had a large shape. It gave an inhuman screech before running off into the woods. The next day, we told the camper to pack up their stuff and move out. When we were moving, I saw a gray blur on the edge of the wood. When I was about 12, I had a lot of issues with night terrors and rarely slept a whole night. One night, I got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I sat down, half asleep, thinking of nothing but emptying my bladder and going back to bed, when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. There was a man standing by the other door to the bathroom, staring at me, not moving. He was wearing a tattered gray jumpsuit, had a crutch, and had little to no hair. I don't remember how I got down into the basement where my parents slept, but suddenly there I was, hysterical. My dad finally went up and looked in the bathroom and kitchen. Saw nothing but allowed me to sleep on the couch down there anyway. I didn't fall asleep again. About an hour or so later, I heard the sliding door to the bathroom from my sister's room and limping footsteps. The next morning, my dad searched around and noticed that the fridge and pantry had been raided. Never caught the guy. I once found myself in a cave along with eight or nine other people. It was the middle of the Pennsylvania wilderness, and the only entrance was a small hole in the ground. To enter, you had to sit on your ass, grab a tree root, and drop about seven feet down a steep wall to the floor. We all dropped in and spent at least half an hour exploring this cave. My friend Dan taps me on the shoulder and whispers, Dude, look at the ceiling. The ceiling was just high enough above our heads to hide the thousands of spiders crawling around on it. We tried to keep quiet about it because we didn't want anyone to flip out, but there was no stopping it. Just seconds later, the whole group noticed them. Everyone got silent, and you could actually hear the spiders crawling on the surface of the stone. It was an extra nervous situation because the only way to exit the cave was to basically jump up and pull yourself out of a hole surrounded by spiders. Two of the girls with us were terrified and refused to climb out. They just couldn't muster the courage to put their faces next to a giant spider nest. They came around, though, and everyone got out safely. I had the honor of being the last one to exit. I'm alone in a dark cave filled with spiders, with nobody around to give me a boost. Fortunately, Dan was brave enough to reach down and give me a hand. When we first discovered that cave, we were all like, I can't believe we've never heard of this place. Now I know why. That cave stinks. A few months later, I found out the cave was off limits in the fall because of the rattlesnakes. Duck that cave. When I was a kid, I was staying at some family friend's hobby farm. Me and their boy Sean, we were both around 11 or 12, got up, and I gave him a hand doing his chores on the farm. As we walked up to the barn, we heard a big commotion in the chicken coop. As we walked up to the coop, I noticed motion in the chicken wired 2 by 6 window. Me and Sean are standing 15 feet away from the coop window. I verified with Sean later that we both saw a man appear on the right side of the window. As he floated by the window, he slowly looked over at us, 
and as if finding us wanting, he turned away and continued out of sight. I will never forget the look on that face. It was the face of an old man who was bloated and severely ill. Unfortunately, it was a face that seemed very familiar. Both me and Sean thought it was his father. His father at the time was a healthy and fit 45-year-old, but we were both left with the impression that we had seen his father. Anyway, we rush up to the coop to see what's going on. There was nothing there except agitated chickens doing their thing. Me and Sean talked about it for the rest of the day and could make no sense of it. His dad had been gone running errands since 5 a.m. and didn't return until later that afternoon. Me and Sean never talked about it after that day. In hindsight, I can see why it became taboo. I fell out of touch with Sean as I got older, until I got a call from my parents to let me know that Sean's dad had passed away from cancer and give me information on his service. The service was at the old hobby farm. Being there brought back a lot of memories, but I'm sure I wasn't thinking about me and Sean's spooky incident. My brain had filed that under miscellaneous long ago and forgotten about it. Right up until I saw a certain picture in a collection of images from Sean's father's life. The picture that caught my eye was one taken a few weeks before he passed. There he was holding his newly born granddaughter, and I guarantee you that he was the same man I saw looking over at me and Sean that happily forgotten day from our childhoods. There's no doubt about it. When I saw the face, I was immediately transported back to that moment. All the smells, doubts, and fears. I guess that's it. I am agnostic, loathe superstition, and by no means wish to contribute to it, but this did happen to me. When I was 15, my sister, a year younger, bought an Ouija board. We lived in a very conservative Christian neighborhood where everybody knew everybody. We were the weird family because we didn't go to church and listen to bad music. My dad has always been into weird occult shit and would always tell us spooky stories about how he would contact ghosts when he was a kid and how our family was haunted by a ghost named George. I never believed in any of that SHT and assumed he was just trying to entertain us with ghost stories. So anyway, my sister buys an Ouija board. When the neighbors find out, they accuse my sister of being a witch. Only a few kids would come hang out with us after that. So my sister has a friend over one night, and they decide to play with the thing. I never messed with it because I thought it was silly, but my sister's friend was hot, so I decided I was going to join them. My sister informs me at this point that she has been speaking with George for about a week. I kind of laugh it off, saying, yeah, sure, whatever, and then we start. My sister asked, are you there, George? Yes etc. The sister's friend starts getting scared and wants to stop. I'm smirking and teasing them both. This is all fake, you know? Suddenly, the pointer thing starts running all over the board. My sister and her friend were the ones touching the thing, so I still wasn't buying it. So I say, George, you're not real, I don't believe in you. The board spells out why? Because you can't be real. If you're real, prove it. How? Move something. At that exact moment, and I mean that exact moment, all of our power went off. We flipped out and took off outside, waiting for our dad to come home from work. When he gets home, we tell him everything, and he turns white as a sheet. He tells us to stay outside and he goes in and gets the lights back on and tells us everything is okay. Needless to say, every other kid knew about it the next day, and we were pretty much outcasts after that. Me and my cousin were out canoeing when night fell. We had crossed a couple of wooded paths to get to some lakes and rivers not accessible straight by boat. We were determined to get back to our camp but lost track of time. We were on our stretch of woods before we got to the main lake, where our camp was located. We finished dragging our canoe to the lake but had to track back to the river we came from to get our paddles and gear. It was already past sunset, and it was overcast, so it was pitch dark in the woods. The flashlight we had ran low on batteries, so it was barely producing an orange glow where we shined it, so we just turned it off and tried to let our eyes adjust to the dark. We got our gear and started walking back to the main lake, where our canoe was located. Something was stalking us. I could hear something trailing us maybe 30 feet away, but it would go silent when we stopped to hear what it was. It was like a 10 minute walk, but it felt like an eternity. My mind would keep going to a bear, but I kept on reasoning that it could be a number of other curious animals. We just kept walking calmly and not changing our speed until we got to the canoe. I kind of rushed into the canoe and back to camp. I've never been creeped out by nature before, but being stalked in the pitch dark woods was one of the creepiest experiences of my life. I am an 18-year-old female who grew up in Michigan and has lived in the country for as long as I can remember. On one particular hot summer weekend, me and a couple friends, including my boyfriend, let's call him Tony, and my older brother, let's call him Brad, decided we were going camping for the weekend since it was such a nice warm week. Tony's parents owned a cabin way out in Ludington, 
surrounded by a huge wooded area with a personal lake and no neighbors for at least four miles. But being stupid teenagers, we didn't really think about that. All we were ready for was to party like any normal teenager would. Well, after being there for two hours, our fun had started. Tony's friends had brought tons of alcohol and weed to last us for the weekend so we wouldn't be bored since we had no service and only movies to watch. After it got around 12 a.m. and was pitch black, we had a huge bonfire going. There were a total of six people, including me and Tony. As we talked and laughed about upcoming events in our lives, we were so distracted that we didn't notice that my brother had literally frozen his eyes on one section of the woods. Mind you, we were all intoxicated and high at that time. Eventually, our talking ceased when Tony realized his friend and my brother had an emotionless expression. Hey dude. You alright? He asked Brad. Silence. Brad didn't reply or even make any movements that would indicate he heard him. After that, I started to get scared, as did the other two girls there. It took a lot for my brother to act that way. Eventually, I was the first to catch on that he was excessively staring into a certain spot in the woods. I turned my head and followed his gaze as best I could. And when I finally caught on to what he was staring at, my heart dropped. There, right ducking there, was, at first glance, a dog. At least that's what I thought. It was some person's dog that wandered off. But then my brain kicked in, and I realized there weren't neighbors for miles. So how could there be a dog? My mind started to race while Tony still tried to get Brad to speak or even move. In one motion, this thing stood up tall. And when I say tall, I mean ducking gigantic. It had to be at least six feet tall. Everyone saw it then. How could you not? The other two girls and the other boy with us gasped as they finally grasped why my brother was as still as a stick. No one moved for what seemed like hours. Tony was the first to talk. No tail, he mumbled. No one heard what he said but Brad. And I swear to you when I say his eyes widen as big as pan saucers. That freaked me out immediately. What did you say? One of the girls asked it. Has. No. Ducking tail, he hissed at her. My heartbeat stopped. He was right. There was no tail on this thing. Suddenly, my clouded alcohol mind cleared up in a fraction of a second when I finally realized what this thing was. Now I understood why my brother was basically shitting his pants. This thing was a skinwalker. My instincts kicked in right then and there, but before I could get the duck out of there, the thing let off a terrible stench like rotting meat before screaming inhumane. The sound was enough to scare the duck out of everyone. My brother was the first to get out of his chair and started shouting native words to the creature, which is why I told everyone to get the duck inside. No one questioned me when they saw just how dead serious I was, especially Tony. He's never seen me so scared, so he knew it was a bad situation. We all high-tailed it into the cabin with my brother in tow, still shouting native words at the creature, which seemed to keep it at bay while giving us enough time to get inside. He slammed and locked the door before turning all the lights off and grabbing a special ash from the kitchen counters and starting throwing it at every window and door while chanting. Of course, he had everyone freaked out and basically in tears at that moment. After he was done, no one said a word for a long time. All of us are still in shock. He grabbed our dad's pistol and had it posted by him for hours. Everyone was entirely too shaken up to even question what happened. We must have fallen asleep eventually because I woke up to my brother packing all our stuff into the two cars early in the morning. I understood why. We had a native family. We knew what we were dealing with, and we knew it would come back, maybe not alone. Before we left, I did a blessing on the cabin and spoke a few calming words to the still very freaked out girls. We left as soon as everything was packed up. To this day, we still haven't explained exactly to our friends what happened that night. And they never bothered to ask us either. I was driving home through back roads I had never been on when I came across a bookstore in a tiny town in the woods. The bookstore was actually a house, where the front of the home had been converted into a store. There was a box on the porch that said .50 books. So I stopped to see if there were any Stephen King books in there. A middle-aged woman comes out with a huge smile and gives me a bowl of fruit and some tea. I'm like, this place is awesome. And rifle through books while eating the fruit and downing the tea. Inside the store or home. There were a lot of cool art books and stuff, so I spent some more time there. She brought me more tea. Even when I said, no thank you, that's plenty, she kept refilling. She gave me dessert too, brownies and cookies. I didn't realize it at the time, but she was drugging me. It's hazy to remember the details, but at some point, she closed the shop, telling me to take my time looking at the books. She told me that she was going to go take a shower and would be gone for a while. When I was ready to pay, I had to wander back through her house to find her. I found her in her bedroom. She was in bed. I'm pretty sure she was naked. 
At the time, I thought, weird, she's watching an exercise video in bed? But later realized she was watching porn. You might think this is hot, but it isn't. She was my mom's age and had been telling me how she reminded me of her kids in college. So, not hot. I told her I was ready to pay, and she told me how to open the register, so I went and opened it, put in what I thought I owed, took out the change, and left. When I stumbled outside, a fire engine drove by, screaming with sirens. In the distance was the glow of a big forest fire, and the stars were being covered by smoke. A tall man on a horse watched the fire truck pass. He looked right at me, took a piece of wood or something out of his mouth, and said, the town's burning. I swear to God I have a crystal clear memory of this happening, even though I'm sure it couldn't have. By this point, I guess I was seriously tripping over something. I'm not a drug guy, so I don't know what I had, but I was out of my mind and could hardly walk. I got back in my car and drove, home along twisting roads on tall cliffs above the ocean. Twice, I realized I was on the wrong side of the road. One of the times I realized this was because a massive truck was headed straight for me, laying on the horn and flashing its lights. I kept thinking about how my car could be like an aeroplane and a submarine if I drove it off the cliff. I can't believe I made it home alive. Later, I realized I had been in that house for about four hours looking at books. At least that's what I hoped to hell I was doing. Throughout the day, we take our two dogs outside to their kennels so they can get out of the house for a while and run, play, and such. These are not small dogs, one is a black lab slash husky mix, and the other is a full-blooded Staffordshire Terrier, Pitbull. The kennels are placed at the edge of the yard, near the woods. These woods are big, large enough to take a day to go hiking through them. Lately, when it gets dark, the dogs seem on edge. They will bark and whine at the house to come in. At first, I figured they just wanted to get back into the house, but now I'm thinking they're actually scared. Three nights ago, when I went to get them, it was already dark, but we have a security light, so it isn't pitch black or anything. I got to the front of the first kennel and noticed both dogs were being quiet. They always bark at me excitedly when I go to get them, but they were dead silent. This weirded me out a little, but not to the point of being scared. I will admit that there was a certain uneasiness in the air, though, something I can't explain, but it sort of felt electric, like I was about to be shocked. The longer I was there, the more uneasy I felt. I started getting the first dog, the lab, out and heard a heavy snap in the woods near the kennels. I froze, the dogs froze. By this time, I was so on edge that if someone had spoken, I would have jumped, screamed, and possibly ran. The creepy feeling in the air just kept getting thicker. The lab had her bushy tail stuffed underneath her and was whining. This didn't make me feel any better. The pit bull was as far away from the woods as she could get, whimpering for me to come get her. I can only take one dog in at a time because they get too excited and will sometimes try to fight, so I avoid that at all costs. I felt so bad leaving Pity there by herself, but I had to do it. As I walked away, she barked this high-pitched, whining type of bark at me that I had never heard her do before. The lab couldn't get to the house quick enough. I went back for the other one and dreaded every step as her door is right at the base of the woods. I would have to turn my back to the woods to open her door and get her out. The air felt heavy and stale, with an unpleasant smell, like a dead skunk, as I approached the kennel. Another snap, and I was about ready to run for it, but I didn't want to leave my dog, who had her head down defensively facing the woods. I could barely make it. To be honest, it felt like trying to walk through water. I was terrified by the time I reached the door. I heard heavy breathing behind me as I got my dog out. She was scared too, but she started growling behind me. I was frozen in place. The breathing continued for a minute before I heard steps start coming towards us. We both took off at the same time. A terrifying scream came out of the base of the woods. I didn't dare look back, I just ran. My stomach pulled me all the way back to the house. I got in, flipped off all the lights, and stared out the window at the woods. I could see something moving slightly, but just out of the light. It moved back and forth for about five minutes, then disappeared. It took me forever to fall asleep that night because I was so scared that every little noise freaked me out. The next night, I went to get the dogs earlier, right around dusk. I thought all was well until I was getting my pants out. A huge snapping sound, like a tree branch had just been snapped in half, rang out. It sounded pretty far away, so I just hurriedly got my dog and started towards the house. A few steps away from the kennel, I heard something big start charging towards me from inside the woods. We ran again, and it appeared to follow for so long, then retreated back. Now, every night since then, I hear sounds coming out of the woods, like branches breaking and being thrown around, knocking on trees, and roaring. I am absolutely terrified. 
I no longer even take my dogs down, I just take them for walks during the day and make sure we are all in before dusk. I was 13 at the time and I was the loner of my life and I enjoyed being alone and going on little trips into the woods and doing dome reading and other little things, and I did like to leave in the middle of the night and hide among the trees thinking I was a ninja or something like that, but I went out to play in the trees and I did have to come back because it was dark and when everyone was asleep I snuck out to see the creek in the moonlight, and so I was walking there being I was supposed to be asleep and I wasn't very bright and realizing I had no idea where I stopped and heard crunching behind me. I looked and saw a mountain lion inching a good 30 feet to my left side away. I stumbled and striped spurting. I noticed it heard me fall and stared at me. Then I screamed and jumped and ran, not knowing if it was following. I ran to a small graveyard and fell over a tomb. To feel an ice cold hand grab me rough by the wrist was true horror. I was yanked to my feet and pulled. The mountain lion jumped out of the trees and headed for me. I was pulled. I was pulled. I was yanked all the way back to camp. I was yanked all the way back to camp. I fell about 15 feet from the fire. I was yanked all the way back to camp. I was yanked all the way back to camp. I was yanked all the way back to camp. I was yanked she had been trailing me like she did when I left and had noticed someone in the graveyard, not the animals but a large man figure in a hood, walking my way fast and jumped in, so if it weren't for my sister, I would not be alive, even if she doesn't know how much she saved me from. Then she looked into my eyes and said not a word about this to mom. I shook my head knowing we would never tell anyone of our trip into the woods that horrible camping trip. I often visited my grandparents' home in Traverse City, Michigan, during the summers with my parents. Traverse City, TC, is a beautiful place and was home to the Traverse City Regional Psychiatric Hospital, which operated from 1885 to 1989. Since the United States federal government officially deemed the hospital worthy of preservation for its historical significance, the buildings on the hospital grounds were guarded by patrolling security guards. The TC Psychiatric Hospital was massive, many rooms remain empty and abandoned. Underneath the hospital is a sprawling brick tunnel system, which the hospital staff used to safely transport the patients from building to building in the frigid winter temperatures. I am sure there were instances where the patients underwent cruel treatments or were subjected to the care of horrible doctors, but the TC Psych Hospital had a great reputation. Many teenagers, including myself at the time, were unashamedly fascinated with the hospital and its history. As a result, we would often break into abandoned buildings through unbarred windows or doors with pickable padlocks. And paid attention to the guards' patrol patterns, we could go in and out without worry. Breaking into the old hospital was almost a rite of passage for the TC teens. The hospital's interior was terrifying, there was old, stained, and broken equipment and furniture, crumbling floors and walls, vandalism, strange old building noises, and complete and utter darkness in the tunnels, basements, and lower floors. Using flashlights was too risky with the guards patrolling, so we often navigated the hospital by memory and our dimly lit phone screens. Unfortunately, during my last trip inside, I encountered something all too human that terrified me to the point I swore off ever returning. The story takes place around 10 p.m., the moonlight was dim and most patrol guards had left for the day. Clad in black, my friend Jason and I entered through the same window we always used and followed our regular path to one of the tall, jutting spires to sit by the windows that overlooked the entire city. There was only one thing different about this venture from our others, a new faint and unexplainable smoky odor, not smoky like fire but something more akin to incense. The smell was so faint that we almost thought we were imagining it, but it grew stronger as we got closer to our destination. Rather than taking the stairs that led up to the spire, we followed the smell down a different hallway until we reached a room with a deep red glow emanating from the doorway. Rather than doing the smart thing by leaving immediately, we couldn't resist the urge to walk closer and investigate. When we finally reached the room, I audibly gasped and felt Jason grip my wrist so hard that his nails left marks on my skin. We found a large ring of red votive candles and burning incense circling a drawing of a pentagram with the sigil of Baphomet. In the center of the drawing was a dead, bloodied bird surrounded by black feathers. Bear in mind that I was raised devoutly Catholic, so seeing this image filled me with a sense of fear stronger and more paralyzing than any ghost sighting ever could. Later that night, Jason told me I immediately started mumbling prayers, but I personally don't remember doing that. I wouldn't be too terribly surprised, though. While the duration felt infinite, I'm not sure how long we stared at the occult scene before hearing a man's low and ominous voice behind us say, Welcome, friends. I promise you that there was absolutely nothing friendly about the way that guy greeted us. Jason and I screamed bloody murder, whipped around, and saw two nicely dressed but frazzled looking adult men smiling at us. The man in front of me held something in his hand, and while I can't say for sure what it was, I remember thinking it was a knife at the time, 
which wouldn't be too crazy of a guess considering they recently sacrificed a bird. Jason and I sprinted past the two, and I felt someone's fingers grab the back of my shirt. Thankfully, the occultist's hand didn't have a solid hold on me because I ducked and managed to escape his grip. The men shouted for us to stop running, we obviously didn't. We heard their footsteps chasing after us for a little while, but thankfully Jason and I had broken into the hospital so many times that running through the unlit rooms, hallways, and tunnels was no challenge. When we finally reached and vaulted through our escape window, the occultists were nowhere to be seen or heard. We kept running through the hospital grounds until we reached Jason's car, with no concern for the patrol guards. We would have rather gotten caught by the guards than the occultists. I puked twice in the parking lot, whether the cause was fear, sprinting non-stop for a mile and a half, or a combination of both. I'm not sure what would have happened if the occultists caught us, but I know for certain they weren't going to crack open a beer and sing Kumbaya by the candlelight. I'm not familiar with cultic practices or satanic rituals, so I'm not sure what the men were trying to do or if they were summoning something. Jason and I never returned to the hospital during that summer or any of the following summers. While we aren't close now that we're adults, I know that horrifying experience will keep us cemented in each other's memories until we die. When I was 14, I walked into our dining room. My little sister, 8, was standing partially concealed by curtains. I spoke to her, and she turned. It was not my sister. The girl was holding a black cat and smiled at me as if she were waiting for me to say something. Then she disappeared. I ran to my mom, scared silly, and told her. My mom is very open to unexplained things and never panics. Fast forward 15 years, and I am married with two daughters, ages 8 and 2. I walk into the living room and see my oldest standing partially concealed behind the drapes. I speak to her, and she turns. She smiles expectantly as she strokes Shadow, our black cat. She doesn't disappear, lol, but she is the girl I saw at 14 in my childhood home. I tell my mom, and she says, well, there you go. Mystery solved. I live in a rural area of East Tennessee called Hampton. It's a small town where everyone knows everyone. We were home alone as our dads went out for a night of drinking in a more suburban town about 20 or so minutes away named Johnson City, so naturally we did what 16-year-olds do, we got pretty blazed and went for a car ride. The roads were completely empty, and we had been driving for about 10 or so minutes. There were streetlights along the road we were traveling down for increased visibility for drivers at night, and that's when me and my cousin reached a little dip in the OAD. Suddenly, my cousin gasped and beckoned my attention to the side of the road. Naturally, I slowed down and squinted my eyes to see the figure of a man, at this point, my headlights were still flicked off, as we were coming towards the guardrail. I could sense something was just off like there was electricity in the air at something I still can't explain to this day, so I flicked my headlights on and standing just behind the guardrail was a man, he was about 6'2 maybe 6'3 but one thing was off about him, he was completely skinless, you could see every detail of the man's exposed muscle and bone, as soon as I flicked my headlights on to see this horrid thing he jumped back a little seemingly surprised by my headlights, and for a split second the two of us met eyes, and before I could even blink he was over the edge, he had seemingly jumped, I was fairly freaked out to say the least so I sped off not giving any care to the neighbors I may have woken from my speeding car, we soon made it home and booked it inside, still in utter disbelief we called the police. As we talked to the operator and told them our situation she took a fairly rude tone asking if this was some kind of sick skinless Tom joke and told us that these calls held up other potentially attention requiring matters and abruptly hung up, after the call me and my cousin were somewhat pissed, but one thing the operator said caught my attention, skinless Tom. Apparently a man named Tom and a woman were going out for dinner and a stroll in the park, whilst in the park the woman's husband emerged from the dense woods in front of the two, Tom realizing what was happening started to tell the man he had no idea she was with anyone, sadly this didn't reach the man, the man started to beat Tom and had brought a hunting knife with him, he started to skin Tom, when the woman reported this the husband was arrested and confessed to the whole thing, what's intriguing about this case is that Tom was never found but the skin from his body was found at the crime scene creating the legendary in my area of Tennessee folklore tale of Skinless Tom. People have reported seeing him around this area for about four years now, I'm almost certain what I saw that day was Skinless Tom. My cousin says he had an even more horrifying memory, he recounts that when the man turned and looked back at us before jumping that the thing had an insane smile on its face a massive hunting knife in its left hand, now if it were just me that had saw it I would have just thought I was too stoned and simply had imagined it all, but my cousin was there to solidify everything from this story. We were camping at a spot we hiked a few miles up to. For NW folks, we were by Brown Creek, close to the high steel bridge across the railroad trestle. To set this up, there was a massive logging hill that was in view of our campsite. It's shown on the map, 
but it wasn't covered in trees when we went. We hiked around it while it was light out. There was literally no road access here. The roads shown on the map were all blocked off by either six-foot impassable trenches or massive mounds of dirt that would have required a rock crawler to get over. There was no way a human could have gotten on that hill in the dark, and since we hiked around it fairly late in the evening to gather water from the stream, there was no way someone could have gotten in and set up camp without us noticing. Fast forward to around 1 a.m. it's completely blacked out. There are no lights or civilization for miles other than a farm or two a few miles back. We're sitting around the fire, bullshitting, and drinking. All of a sudden, I notice a light moving right where the hill was when it was light out. It was bobbing back and forth like a person walking with a flashlight. There was no conceivable way up this hill in the dark. It was logged and regrown, which meant lots of heavy brush covering the entire thing. Any access via vehicle, we would have heard other than us talking and the crackle of the fire, everything was silent. The light bobbed around the hill for well over an hour, as if someone were just wandering. They would have easily been able to see us sitting around the fire from that high vantage point. We called out to it or them. We tried to get a little closer, but there was no negotiating the terrain on the hill at night. No answer. We heard some faint rustling of the brush, that was all. It was pretty damn creepy, and we never did figure out what it was. We hiked around and up the hill the next morning, but there were no signs of any activity or of the roads being any more passable than they were the day before.